In this segment, we will review the latest advances in diagnostic and prognostic biomarkers and genetic testing for prostate cancer. We will discuss several companies that are actively evaluating potential diagnostic and prognostic biomarkers and validated assays for use in prostate cancer. Let's begin the segment with some general questions on biomarker development and genetic testing in prostate cancer. You know, I think this really boils down to you know, a couple things. Um, I think, Neil, again, you've been a big proponent of this. You know, you and I have looked at this extensively over the past couple of years. I think the way most of us look at it is that the biomarker world, which I think is a, is a oftentimes used term, and I think a lot of physicians, a lot of urologists tend to put it in one bucket. Mm -hmm. I really do think it needs to be really parceled out in, into various buckets. And really, I think it's, it's who needs an initial biopsy? That is there a, is there a test that, that outperforms PSA? And we all know that PSA is, a, is under attack since the uh, uh, Preventive Services Task Force recommendation in 2012. For patients who, who have had a biopsy and who have had a negative biopsy, who needs rebiopsy? There's also the question of if you have a positive biopsy, which one of those patients has a risk of progression or mortality, or who is going to be a better patient for active surveillance? And probably the biggest one, which right now has the least amount of data and people looking at it is if you're on a therapy, is there a marker that you can use to predict remission, can predict response or failure? So, Neil, would you disagree with any of that? Or, um, so, I mean, I mean, that's kind of how we've always looked at it because I do think they need to be looked at very separately. Yeah, no, I think you did a great job of uh, taking, uh, there's a lot of new information out there, and I like the way you broke it out into those three buckets, so who to biopsy in the first place, uh, and then who to do a repeat biopsy or not on, and then in the newly diagnosed patients, and you alluded to the, the task force, and we know that it's probably fine to diagnose and have that information, we want to avoid over-treatment, over-utilization of therapies, and I think that was the big rub that came out uh, and so we don't want to, as people say, throw the baby out with the bathwater. We, we need to continue to screen. We just need to be smarter about how we screen, and we need to be more judicious about how our treatment recommendations. So there have been some fabulous advances in genomic assay products to help us with that. So, Dr. Cheatham, we know that PSA as a screening test is not the best. We know what the most recent guidelines were that were released by the AUA, which was very controversial, and, and we, this is far beyond the scope of this discussion right now. So in terms of what else is out there from PSA? You know? I mean, look, PSA, as we all know, it's got its pros, it's got its cons, it's been around for a long time. There is still yet to be a single biomarker that's completely trumped the PSA in terms of its accuracy. But I think what we're going to see moving forwards, we're not necessarily going to see one biomarker that replaces PSA. I think we're going to see much more of this panel of biomarkers that we can uh, offer the patient. So particularly for those people who are at high risk of prostate cancer with strong family histories. Interestingly, if you've had an elevated PSA and you've had a prostate biopsy, that's negative for prostate cancer, you have a one in seven chance of being exposed to five more biopsies, which are almost certainly gonna remain negative or potentially detect insignificant disease clinically. And we need to move away from that. I'm a huge proponent of imaging the prostate before biopsying to see if there's a lesion that you may miss with your usual sites of sampling. I also think that we need to remember that biopsy is not without risk. And I think we have to do our due diligence to counsel the patient about their risk of having a positive biopsy. And remember that patients who have a biopsy it is an invasive procedure for a small percentage of people. They can wind up in the hospital requiring intravenous antibiotics. For patients, it can be life-threatening. We need to make sure that we address these issues. Obviously, for the right patient, the biopsy still has a role. And that, again, is another big hot potato here that that may become obsolete with MRI imaging becoming much better. Uh, a few months ago, I was asked to write a book chapter on biomarkers for prostate cancer, looking at biomarkers in urine, blood, and prostate tissue. 
and with busy weekends, the paper was being delayed and delayed, and every weekend delay in writing the paper, there were more and more biomarkers being discovered, and it's quite difficult to remain on top, but I think these panels of markers are what we're going to see moving forward, it's not just individual biomarkers that replace PSA. So when you look at what's out there, so again, if we look at these buckets, so, so let's start with the first bucket. So the first bucket is, we know that by itself, PSA is valuable. We know that it's under attack, but we also know that, like Dr. Cheatham says, a lot of patients will undergo unnecessary biopsies because the positive, the, the positive predictive value right now is depending upon what paper you read, you know, may run from anywhere from 30 to 45 percent. It's interesting, we've looked at our data in Nashville, and actually our, and I don't know if it's more judicious use of PSA, but our, our positive predictive value is actually north of 40 percent now. Um, you know, we know that the LUGPA data you know, is, is also very consistent with that. But we also know that, you know, PSA is a calocrine, it's prostate specific, but it's not prostate cancer specific. So we know that there is a company out there called Opco Health, and so Opco is a is a biomolecular lab that's that's based out of uh, based out of Florida, and they are actually going to release a they're going to uh, present their data on their on their 4K score test. Um, this was a you know this is a test that is a that is a serum based. Excuse me, it's plasma based. And it basically takes into account uh, a panel of total PSA, free PSA, intact PSA, and human calocrine too. So you know we know that's going to be released. Um, there, you know, there there is also the prostate health index uh, that that's that's available, I believe, through Beckman Coulter. Uh, we also know that there's the Michigan uh, Prostate Score, which takes into account PSA, PCA3 as well as Tempers 2 uh, erg fusion. So the question really is, is will any of these replace PSA? Right now they're not, they're not being touted to replace PSA. They should be used in conjunction with PSA. But Mike, where do you see all this going? I mean, you know, this is like a nuclear arms race. <laughs> I, I, to echo your, your item about your book chapter, it's, this is something that is exploding. Um, and it's almost you know, outpacing the research for, for these things. Um, I think right now we've got a test that's about 67% uh, helpful, and then we've added a little bit of a percentage with each one of these little things, whether it's a 4K score or the, or the Michigan test. There's all different aspects that can improve. I think just getting people to fundamentally think about it again in that aspect, we can even go back to making it more simple and take Ian Thompson's PCPT calculator. You know, this is a very easy test to plug in um, to just talk to patients about whether or not they should have a biopsy, what their actual risks are, taking into account the number of infections that may be coming from a trust biopsy. Because unlike whenever we first started training, we were all searching for prostate cancer. You gotta get rid of the prostate cancer. You gotta find it and get, get rid of it. Now we're kind of backing away. We're using MRI in those patients that have an advancing PSA rather than just going straight to another biopsy or a saturation biopsy per se. We're actually seeing, uh, trying to identify that disease. Maybe it's in the anterior aspect of the prostate. And that really takes another example of coordination, having a radiologist that understands prostate MRI. That's not an easy thing. Uh, we just actually have developed have two new fellow trained guys that are specifically for prostate MRI. And that has made a lot of difference because now we can say, okay, we're really looking for a guy with elevated PSA. Where is the lesion? Whereas we can also tell them, you know, we know that they, they, they has cancer. We're looking for is there a specific lesion that's actually outside or extra capsular extension or something along those lines. It's, it's an, explosion, an exploding field, and I think it's going to make a lot of difference. It's just whether or not we're going to be able to keep up with the research component for all of these new aspects to really make a difference. That's the key. And I think as well, you know, if patients read about this in the media, about this new biomarker, and they come in with their newspaper article, can you give me this task? Do you offer this task? What do you think about this task? And it's pretty embarrassing, I think, when the patient comes in and asks you about a biomarker for prostate cancer that you may not have heard of, but many of these biomarkers are still being used 
in research settings, and yet we have to be educated you, to counsel the patients as to whether we think this is a good idea and understand the sensitivity and specificity of these tests. And I think to follow up on both those points, I think, I think you're right, is that, that you know, information gets put out there in all different ways. And, and you know, Dr. Google has the ability to do these consults. And, and, and you know, you know, they're walking in and, and they're giving you this information. It's a, it's a series of 30 patients here. You know, there's a, you know, it's all, you know, very individualized. And I think, Neil, you know, you've, you know, we've talked about this, is that this is going to become a real issue in terms of reimbursement. Because again, it's the, the ability to get these tests commercially approved, the bar is, is much, much lower than it is to get a drug approved. And so now all of a sudden, you can get these labs, you can get these tests to market, and the question is, is okay, you have to look at the data, critically analyze it, and say, um, hey, you know, is, this, is this where we want to be? You know, um, you know, you may want to comment upon Elaine, you know, Elaine Jeter's Moldex program and, you know, you know how that's going to come <clears throat> into play. Yeah, I, I think we're all familiar with this uh, graveyard of past diagnostics and prognostics that are no longer around because they came out with their uh, validation studies, but they didn't do what are called prospective clinical utility trials, and they never got uh, CMS-approved diagnostic codes for reimbursement, so they're gone. And um, thanks to Dr. Elaine Jeter, who, who r ran the Palmetto Division of CMS and who's now heading the Moldex pro program, the Molecular Diagnostics Program, there's a very scientific vetting of the different uh, biomarkers that are being asked to receive reimbursement through, primarily through CMS, which I think will be the, the standard for other uh, insurance companies. And one of the biggest things is having what are called subject matter experts in the field review their validation trials, but also their prospective clinical utility trials. A prospective clinical utility study has to show that our colleagues uh, took the information and really did something with it rather than say, oh, this is interesting, but that they really did and changed their behavior. And when you think about it, that's just good stewardship. So, so Dr. Elaine Jeter, she's heading it. I, my hat's off to her. She's really, it's, a, it's an enormous amount of effort, but she does have experts in the field to help her with it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, just like anything.